record a meeting here, you guys. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start with our presentation. And then after that, Matt will start. So here, let me get the presentation going. And I hope everybody's having a, a, a great Tuesday. Okay. So um, for those of you that don't already know this, just a quick reminder, um, Iowa Organic Association is a nonprofit organization committed to organic education, advocacy, and community cooperation. We were established back in 2006. And our mission is to advance organic agriculture and food systems in Iowa. Our members represent a diverse community of Iowa's farmers, gardeners, food and farm businesses and advocates and consumers uh, for the organic movement. Um, as far as our priorities, we have four overarching priorities, um, education, outreach, advocacy, and community. And I'll touch on all of those briefly. As far as education is concerned, we provide programs uh, and information to help expand and diversify organic opportunities in Iowa. Some of the things that we have done um, uh, have been the growing organic expertise workshops that were geared towards technical service providers. We actually had quite a few of those with NRCS folks uh, last year. Uh, and we have expanded that um, to growing organic expertise in colleges across Iowa through the REAP SEP grant. Um, and this past fall, I myself and 10, um, actually 12 organic farmers presented at 10 different colleges. Um, and then I am putting together um, and reaching out back to these colleges and in the spring semester, we'll uh, circle back with these professors and universities and actually have organic field days where we're inviting inviting these students back on the farm to experience an, an organic farm firsthand. Uh, in addition, we created the Midwest Organic Poor Conference, and uh, we are uh, heavily involved in various field days, obviously webinars that you're part of, and uh, have a variety of online resources on our website. As far as outreach, our target audience is, of course, anyone and everyone in within the organic community. We participate in various uh, conferences, trade shows and community events. Uh, speaking of conferences, we're actually gonna be uh, a sponsor of Practical Farmers of Iowa this week. Uh, so if you're gonna be there, be sure to stop by our booth. Uh, Roz and I will be there uh, this Friday and Saturday. Oops, didn't mean to go. Okay, and then as far as advocacy, uh, we develop relationships with policy leaders and try to influence them and, and try to uh, support our organic uh, community. Uh, we actually met with Secretary Nag last year and are planning to revisit with him again this year. And then community, of course, you guys are part of our community and uh, we in encourage a culture of collaboration by connecting organic experts uh, and resources to strengthen uh, our community. As far as resources, um, uh, if you haven't uh, seen this before, I would definitely highly recommend checking it out. It's under our resources page. It's our organic resource directory. Uh, this is a document that, that is available in hard copy. So if you guys would like a hard copy instead of a PDF version, uh, reach out to me. I'm more than happy to mail a hard copy your way. Um, but this particular document has over 900 businesses, nonprofits, educators, educators and service providers that basically can help anyone uh, that is involved in, in the organic movement. Um, so it serves as a valuable tool for our community to achieve growth and continued success. And then, of course, as a nonprofit organization, we heavily rely on your support. Um, you know, if you're not a member, definitely consider becoming one. And if you have a business and would like to become a sponsor, feel free to reach out to myself or Roz, our executive director, to explore these opportunities. Um, thank you again for being here today, you guys. And I will stop and then uh, Matt can take over. All right. Um, am I on? Is everybody seeing me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Well, thank you. It sounds like um, 
we have a good attendance here today. And uh, I guess I, I thought it was interesting, the biography introduction thing that was sent out on the email. I read that. I was like, I don't think that's what I sent to Olga. What I had written was that, um, you know, that I've been farming organically for 20 years. And of those 20 years, every single year has been a challenge as far as weed control. And I don't, I didn't see that line in there, but um, I'm not on here because I'm perfect at doing weed control, but I uh, do find weed control to be fun. And it's something that a lot of people dread. And so I think because I do enjoy it, um, that means that I've had a certain amount of success with it. It's not, again, that I've been perfect, but um, there is a, a, enough success that I've had. And hopefully you're able to pick up a few tips um, with today's presentation. Um, I guess if we go to a, now I have to push that button that says share screen, right, Olga? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because it's just my face on there right now. Yes. Correct. So um, we'll take you to a few pictures. Uh, can you see the screen now? Yeah, I can see your presentation now. Right. So if you want to click on the slideshow, that'd be great. All right. So I've been to a lot of other people um, and talking about weed control. And a lot of the presentations have kind of the same uh, basic tips. And, and I'm sure many of you... Uh, this is not your first presentation on weed control. And um, just to review some of the general keys when it comes to successful weed control is that um, you need to have a good uh, crop rotation and cover crops uh, also help with weed control. A, a good principle is, is to get your weeds when they're as small as possible because the longer you wait, the harder it is to get the weeds out. Uh, another general principle for weed control is timeliness is, and that's kind of a back to get them when they're small, but there's a certain time when the weeds are vul vulnerable and, and you need to uh, get after them at that time. Another thing is, is that we do not have control over um, the weather. And that makes it, makes it especially challenging because when it's the best time to cultivate or to rotary hoe or to harrow, uh, maybe the weather isn't cooperating with us. Um, another key factor is that you need to have good cultivation equipment. I know a lot of people have said that, well, organic farming is kind of like the way grandpa used to do it. And so we just went and pulled the cultivators and you know, rotary hull out of the grove and, and, and that's how we're going to organic farm. But if we don't have good tools, um, we can't expect the best results. Um, the other thing that's really important is to know that we're going to have to do some hand weeding in order for the uh, system to be successful, especially with large seeded broadleaves such as giant ragweed, sunflowers, um, cockleburs. If you do not uh, hand weed those out, you're going to uh, end up with a lot of those types of weeds that can really overtake your crop. And finally, a couple other things are make sure you have clean equipment, like if you get a combine uh, that has weed seed in it, don't move it from one field to the other, that will spread it. And another factor that a lot of people don't think about is how important drainage and fertility is. Um, if we Here in Northern Iowa, drain tiles are extremely important. And if we do not have a field that is well pattern tiled, um, that's going to delay us in our timeliness. It's also going to encourage more weeds to grow in that waterlogged, compacted soil. And then fertilize, uh, your fertility program is going to affect your, your weed control. So those are, you know, those principles that everyone talks about when we're talking about weed control. Um, one of the things that I was very fortunate um, to have uh, experienced is that I worked as an organic inspector for 13 years, um, mainly with the Iowa Department of Agriculture. And through that experience, I was able to travel to hundreds of farms across the state and see what farmers are doing uh, for weed control um, and see what's uh, worked the best uh, year in and year out. And um, that way I was able to learn by not making so many mistakes myself. So I'm very thankful for that. And I guess as I traveled across the state, you know, a lot of people will think that um, 
you know, organic farms, you, you can tell an organic farm when you're driving down the road because um, it looks like it's full of weeds. But from my experience as an organic inspector, I uh, came to see that there were a lot of farms that uh, did a great job with weed control and a weedy field is not something that we can just accept as being part of the organic system. So um, here's a great looking corn field, a great looking soybean field. Um, there's also some fields that uh, were disastrous and, and we don't wanna, you know, when I saw a field like this, it was like, oh my gosh, um, I don't want to end up with a field like this one because we can't even see what kind of crop is in it. So I think everybody feels that emotion too, uh, because this is the field that all your neighbors talk about when you're thinking about being an organic farmer. They're like, oh yeah, we saw an organic farm once time, one time, and this is what they'll end up um, telling you about. Um, these are some older pictures. Ron Hennings from Hartley, he did a great job. He has some organic soybeans here. Clark Tyndall from Lamar's, Iowa, did a terrific job with weed control. There's some volunteer corn that he was going to get out of that field. And you can see that right down in the row, there is not a single weed when you push the beans back. Um, here's another beautiful field that I saw when I was out organic inspecting. And here's Vic Madsen's farm when I did his organic inspection. I know that Eric's been very involved in um, giving tips about cultivation. Uh, so I was able to learn from several farmers um, what worked and what didn't work. Um, here's a field of my corn uh, just before harvest, and it was a good um, crop of corn. Here's a soybean field. My friend came and helped me do some combining, and it's not perfect. There's some uh, foxtail that you see in the foreground, but uh, these beans are 50 plus bushel per acre soybeans. And so the few weeds that are out there didn't do a lot to um, hurt with the um, yield. And here's another picture. So these are the kinds of things that um, we want to uh, see as far as good weed control. Now, I've also had my like I said, it is, I'm not perfect at weed control and I've had my share of disasters. This is a picture um, from several years ago and I thought I would try to, um, you know, they talk about the benefits of planting early and I um, tried to plant my corn the first week of May and I wasn't able to do as good with the weed control. And so I ended up with this disaster and there's some foxtail there in my cornfield and I tried to cultivate and clean it up the best I could but I couldn't so um, I certainly have not done everything perfect this was a yield map from the um, field and you know I was really embarrassed by it and felt terrible um, that it wasn't better than what it was but we still had a good yielding um, crop and it shows I don't know, it was a good, um, I don't know, 160 bushels per acre or something, so it wasn't bad. My side screen is like in the way, I can't see my... All right, so my weed control program is that what I found to work best is that I want to kill multiple flushes of weeds prior to planting. And um, typically what that looks like for my uh, system, if I'm starting with corn, is I will, um, I have my, first of all, I'll start with this and say that my crop rotation is corn, then soybeans, then corn, and then oats with alfalfa and clover. And so after, and, and the oats and alfalfa and clover, the weed control is easy. I don't have a, a problem in that. The key there is that you plant your oats early because oats germinate at, like 42 degrees soil temperature and foxtail um, and a lot of these other weeds grow at 50 to 60 degrees soil temperature. So if we can get those oats in early, they can start growing before the weeds do. And, um, and, and, and the oats are big enough to choke out any weeds that might try to grow. So the weeds uh, are not a problem in the oats and uh, with the clover and alfalfa. After I um, harvest that, um, 
oats and I bale the clover. In the fall, I'll put down some chicken manure and I use a disc ripper and till that in the fall, the disc ripper does not completely kill the alfalfa, but it, it really thins it down severely over the winter. Some will survive and in the spring, about the time that I'm planting my oats out, the alfalfa will be greening up and I will um, go with one pass with a field cultivator and then I'll wait a couple of weeks and I'll hit it again with a field cultivator again and then one more time right before planting. And so there's been uh, uh, multiple flushes of weeds that had an opportunity to grow that are, are killed. Um, for the pre-plant on um, soybeans, I will leave my stock standing in the fall and then I will, uh, and what happens is any weeds that went to seed are laying on the surface all through the winter, exposed to the elements and exposed to mice and uh, insects and other critters. And then in the spring, since those weeds are on top, when it's raining, they, they will try to grow. And then usually about the first week of May, I will take a moldboard plow, plow, plow it and um, field cultivate it twice and plant it just about as soon as I possibly can. So that is uh, how I prepare for my, um, my uh, soybean crop. And then on um, the next year is corn after soybeans. And so I leave the soybean stubble in the fall. I usually inject some liquid swine manure. And so there's some injector marks, but there's really no tillage. And then I'll field cultivate that in the spring. Again, when the fir weeds start, first start to show up, I'll field cultivate it and then I'll wait a week or two and then field cultivate it again right before um, planting. And then uh, after the corn, I disc rip those stalks in the fall and then try and plant as early as possible and we're back to the oat crop. So um, that's kind of how my system works as far as trying to kill multiple flushes of weeds prior to planting. Um, and, and again, there are probably, I'm sure, some, uh, I just want to say this too, is that my operation is corn, soybeans, and oats. And so um, the examples that I'm using are for corn, soybeans, and oats, but I'm sure there's people that are looking at horticultural crops. And the things that I'm telling you, um, those principles can be applied. It's just that that's not the example that I'm using. Um, so as I said, I start with a clean seed bed and then I plant. And then with the corn and the soybeans is I'll wait a couple days and then I'll harrow it. Um, and I might wait a couple more. It just depends on, you know, soil temperatures and how uh, quickly um, uh, the weeds are going to germinate. But there has to be, the point is, is that there has to be some harrowing that is done prior to the emergence of the crop. That's super, super critical because as soon as you stop tilling and plant your crop seed, those weeds are starting to germinate the exact same time as uh, your crop is. And in order to, if you can disrupt that uh, germination of the weeds, it allows the crop to get a head start. Um, and so I'll go and harrow it again. Um, so right before it emerges, um, and so that's typically like the third day for the beans because the beans typically come up on the, the fifth day and the corn will typically grow after maybe eight days. And so on, on about the fifth day, I'll go and harrow it. Um, after the crop has emerged, I'll either use a, a rotary hoe or a long tine harrow. And I have uh, the treffler harrow is the one that I have. I have a, um, um, and the treffler harrow is what I use for this pre-emergent um, harrowing. And the rotary hole I have is a Yetter uh, rotary hole. Um, after I'm done harrowing, I will uh, cultivate the crop two to three times. And um, there's multiple passes with a harrow after the crop is emerged um, or the rotary hole. It's usually two or three passes total with that. And then after I'm done cultivating, I will go out and hand weed out in my soybean field, any um, weeds that are sticking up. And in the corn field, if there's any rag weeds that I have, I wanna make sure to get those hand weeded out just so they don't go to seed. Um, the other thing that's not true of my operation, but I noticed this like with working with the Madsons and, some, uh, and Ron Roseman uh, and Paul Muggy, 
is those guys are very successful organic farmers and they use a ridge till system and it's a really nice system it's just that i don't have the uh, the equipment for it and i my system is working i guess equipment is a big investment and so i've never gone to that system but it's something that is good to think about if you're um you know it's just something to consider the other thing with weed control that i'll mention is flaming and a lot of people like flaming but i don't don't have a flamer i've never used a flamer and um the, and so it's just not part of my system it's something that takes a lot of experience and i have never decided to try it i've been um, felt that i've been successful without it um one other thing is there's this um electrocution of weeds and i've never used that either but this year i tried something different and instead of moldboard plowing um, my corn stalks before i planted soybeans um, somebody talked me into just using the disc ripper because it's faster and no dead froze and you can get it done in the fall but um, it ended up that the corn stalks interfered with my weed control and I had more foxtail. And so I uh, tried to uh, rent one of these uh, electrocutors and it was fun to watch it. And it was fun to uh, see how the field looked a couple days later. But um, I would, and I, I know that they have their place, I guess they're really good on water hemp, but um, it's more of a rescue type treatment and the damage has already been done by those weeds. You might prevent some weed, se uh, weed seed set, but um, my strategy is to focus more on preventing the weeds from becoming a problem rather than trying to go in afterwards and, and uh, solve a problem. So this is kind of the specifics of, of, of what my weed control program looks like and how I go about doing that on my farm. Um, there are some important, um, well, I guess, on this slide, what I want to show you is, well, there's um, there's different things that uh, a buffalo cultivator for a ridge till farmer and the flaming up here, but this guy right here is the mouse. And um, I'm sure many of you have heard about Matt Liedman and, and the work at Iowa State he's done and how many weed seeds are destroyed by the little, little critters in our fields. Um, and so we wanna try and help them out because um, it's not all up to what we do. We have these helping hands and we want to make sure that um, we're taking care of letting that system work. And that's why I do not plow my corn stalks in the fall is because leaving my, and my soybean stubble in the fall is because by leaving those weed seeds on top, um, we let the critters get after them. It's important to understand crop development. And when I talk to you about how important it is to uh, have some pre-emergent um, tillage happening before that crop comes up, we want to make sure that we don't destroy the crop. And corn and soybeans emerge differently. Um, the first thing about corn and soybeans is the planting depth. And because they're big seeded crops, um, I like to plant the soybeans about an inch and a half deep, and I like to plant the corn two and a quarter inches deep. And the main weeds that I'm dealing with are giant foxtail, uh, water hemp, velvet leaf, um, lamb squirters. Those are the main weeds that I have um, to deal with on my farm. I have a few um, giant ragweeds, but like I said, I try to keep very good tabs on them and make sure no, none of them go to seed. And those seeds do not last for a long time, but it's these velvet leaf, their, their seeds last for uh, 50 years in uh, 50 years in foxtail seeds it lasts a long long time and so you just can't hand weed out all your foxtail but the good thing is is that when we're dealing with small seeded weeds like foxtail lamb squirter water hemp and uh, velvet leaf is that the small seeds grow from a higher place in the soil profile than the inch and a half or inch plant is planted our soybean seed is seeded and so what we can do in that inch and a half to two inches that's above the seed is we can till that while those small seeds are trying to germinate and get rid of them and and the other thing is is that with the soybean 
when it emerges, it pulls the seed up out of the ground. And as it's doing that, it has this little hook on here that in this picture, it's labeled hypocotyl. That's the scientific name for it. And you do not want to be tilling your soil when it's in that crook stage because once you break that, your seed is dead, your plant is dead, and it won't be growing. Now, corn, on the other hand, the growing point, the seed stays in the, the ground. And so if we break off a corn shoot, it will grow back. And that's not um, as big of a concern. And so here's a picture of that corn plant. The other thing I want to point out to you with this corn plant is that the way the roots grow out from it's it's a fibrous root system the corn plant is whereas the soybean is more of a tap root system and that's going to affect how you do tillage um, you don't want to go and have tines or something that come along here and 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 sever these roots that are coming out to the side on the soybean plant we don't need to worry about that so much the same with the cultivator is there's more concern about root pruning with a with a corn crop than a soybean crop because of the, the style of root system they have. So keep that in mind. Um, now talking about my equipment. Um, this is a, a, a harrow that I had, a drag harrow. Um, I bought it for $500 or $400 off a farm sale. And so that worked uh, good. Um, that's how I got started. And um, if you wanna get a tool like that, um, you can pick them up but that's um, kind of a crude tool. And then I moved up to this, this Treffler Herald. And the thing about this, this tool here is it just drags across the ground. You have no control over how deep it's going. Now with this new um, tiny Herald that I have, it has these wheels in the back and wheels in the front, and you can uh, control how deep those tines go. And so when I'm talking about just disturbing the top inch and a half so we're not wrecking the crop seed, um, I can make sure that um, it's precise enough that I can make sure that I'm only just tilling the top and not wrecking my crop seed. Um, and so the other, all right, so next, um, if we once it's emerged, so I use this uh, Treffler Harrow to um, do the pre-emergent tillage, and then after it emerges, and here's um, a picture, and I'm gonna um, well, there's another thing I would like to show you. Can I like get out it? There we go. So I think you can see this uh, screen right here. This is my soybean field. And there is a line, um, if you can see my mouse, my arrow, right there's a line on, on the right-hand side, you can see lots of foxtail weeds. Like I said, foxtail is my biggest weed problem. And on the left, it has been tilled. So what I did for this soybean field is I um, you know, did the, harrowing before the crop emerged and then there was a rain that came and it pounded the soil down and it kind of crusted over and it was hard so um and i was out of the field for a few days i kind of got behind and so what i did was i used the rotary hole to uh kind of break up that crust but you can see that there's still weeds there that the rotary hole didn't take the weeds out because the rotary hole works differently than the harrow does and then I came back after I did the rotary hoe and I um, I uh, used the tine harrow and that's what's on the left. You can see that it um, took that out. And we'll just, here is a, I don't know if this video will come through on the, um, on your Zoom meeting, but here's what it looks like. It looks nice on my screen. I hope it looks good on yours. Uh, are you are you trying to share a video, Matt? Is this yeah. the video you're sharing so, on July 26? Um, no. Do you see the Herald, Olga, or not? Uh, you are on slide 26 uh, right okay. now. Is it? All right, we'll go back to slide 26. So apparently that didn't. Um, what are you trying to show? show. Are you trying to show us 27? 
um oh wait a second yeah i was trying to show i was trying to show you a video that was outside of powerpoint but i guess that didn't come through so that's okay we'll just go back to slide number 26. um and then can you make it back into slideshow please yes i can make it back into slideshow except uh, we'll just zip through here again i shouldn't have done that um I didn't know it told you what slide number it is. So we'll get some other video or pictures of the soybeans. We'll talk about the corn then. So here is um, after I went and um, harrowed it before it came up, then the corn emerged and when it was like an inch tall, I harrowed it. Well, then there were these weeds that came up and I harrowed it again. And so there is the before picture that looks really bad because everybody will tell you during their presentations that you need to get the weeds in their white root stage and if you don't then you're kind of sunk which is actually the truth but sometimes the weather doesn't cooperate so here um we had a lot of weeds and then i used the harrow this tine this treffler tine harrow and that's what it looked like afterwards which was just kind of a, amazing um the other thing i'll point out to you is that you can see where these tines are it just kind of um on either side of the row, it piled the soil up to kind of cover up the little weeds. Now up in your top right-hand corner, you can see there's a corn plant that got plucked out. Um, so that's not perfect, but um, here's another picture that is very interesting. And what happened in this picture is that I harrowed my field that first time when the corn was just like an inch and a half tall. And then I got to the edge and off to your right, um, I had eight rows left and my harrow is 60 feet wide, so it takes 24 rows. And so I would have to drive across the field only taking eight and then I was gonna end up on the far end of the field and I have to drive back and I thought, wow, I don't wanna, that just seems like a waste and it doesn't really look like I'm doing a whole lot with this harrow, I'm just gonna leave these eight rows untouched. Well, when we came back five days later, you can see what the harrow did uh, because on the, right hand side is so much more weedy and off in the distance there you see my um tractor and i'm coming with the harrow the second time and here is a picture from the back side and you can see that same dividing line up front where off to the left now is weedy and off to the right is where it is just a little bit weedy because it was harrowed one time but look at what has happened uh behind the harrow it's like cleaning it all I'm just amazed by this. This is what the harrow looked like after I picked it up in the weedy area, just pulled all these weeds out. This is the treffler harrow. Um, one thing that's unique about this treffler harrow that this picture shows is that it has these tine, these um, springs connected to the tines that are different because other harrows have a spring that is part of the tine. It's a little loop at the top, um, but this allows you to have more control and it also, um, it allows you to adjust the tension, the amount of spring pressure on the tine as you're driving across the field. And um, so what I did in this situation where I had a heavy weed pressure is I put more pressure on those tines, made those springs more stiff so that they could pull those weeds out. And if it is so stiff, the problem is it can cover up the crop. And if you're covering the crop up, then you can adjust it so that it is um, less tension and it doesn't push so much soil that it covers the crop up. And so this is a real key feature of this harrow is having um, these adjustable springs that you can adjust as you're going across the field by your hydraulic controls on your tractor. Um, this is something knew that I learned with this harrow this year. And before I was always afraid to um, harrow the corn because um, the corn would get covered up. And people told me, they said, don't be afraid to harrow your corn. I did lots of harrowing on the soybeans and the soybeans always did great. And I never was afraid of wrecking the crop, but on the corn I was. And so I tried it, I just went out there with a the harrow this spring and I 
harrowed it when it was like two inches tall and I was covering up corn and I thought I'm going to have to replant it, but I had enough time in the season. I, I just accepted it. I, it might wreck it. I'll have to replant it. But what happened was like, I didn't look at the field for four days and I came back and then I looked at it and the corn that was covered up, most of it was growing up out of the soil, but um, there were still some plants that didn't make it in with corn. It's important that you have a picket fence stand. Um, and so I was happy with the weed control, but not happy that I didn't have that picket fence stand. And so what I did in this picture was you can see right in the middle, some of these tines are tied up. I tied up two tines on either side of the corn row. And because I have GPS on my tractor, I can follow perfectly um, just with three inches there to let the row go through. Um, and, and what is better to, is to actually tie up like about three or four tines because I showed you how the uh, corn roots come out to the sides those tines are too close and it did prune off some of the corn roots and then the corn will get a little floppy. Fortunately, it grew back, but you would be better off if you tied up about three to four tines instead of just two. But that allows your corn in the row not to get um, covered up and it almost works like just a tiny, um, it's like a tiny little cultivator with all these little shovels. And again, in the beans, I just leave um, them all down. Now you saw in this picture, I have my wings folded up. And the reason again is because I tie those tines up and I have a 16 row planter and my harrow is 60 feet. And, and so it doesn't match the planter exactly. In this picture, I, I have those wings folded up because when the wings are folded up, um, it's 40 foot and it follows the 16 row planter perfectly. Um, but in the beans, I leave it all unfolded or pre-emerge, pre I leave it all unfolded. So that's, um, most people have the exact same size hero as their planter, but that's what I can do with mine. Um, this, in the soybeans, um, this is a picture of the biggest soybeans that I can harrow. And, um, and so the soybeans, I, I basically do the same thing as the corn, but one of the key things with the soybeans is that I will go and um, harrow it and uh, when they're real little, and then when they start to get that first trifoliate leaf, they're big enough to cultivate, and I cultivate them, and I have the shovel set four inches apart. And then um, there's that strip of soil that's four inches wide, so it'd be two inches on either side of the soybean plant and it's loose, but there might be some weeds that are in there, but they're not pulled out. And so after I cultivate that first time, I will go back like the next day and run that tine harrow through it to get that four inches of soil that has been loosened by the cultivator, but the weeds have not been uprooted and the tine harrow will pull those weeds out. And then um, this field here, I actually did one more time when the soybeans were, because like I said, first cultivation is when they're just getting that first trifoliate. These are much bigger than first trifoliate, but there were some little weeds that were coming in the row that my cultivator didn't get. And so I, I used the harrow one more time to get those little weeds out of the, the um, row. And it's a beautiful field of soybeans. Um, of course, there is a picture of a rotary hole. Mine is a yatter. Uh, we talked about the rotary hole there. There's Vic Madsen's uh, buffalo cultivator. Um, and I guess I had my pictures a little bit out of order, but this is what the harrow looks like going through the soybeans. And you can see um, there is residue. Some people will talk about um, the residue being a problem and um, it will take some but you don't want to have a tremendous amount of residue because it can plug up. And so I make sure that my tillage system um, prior to planting has uh, sized up the residue to uh, allow it to get through this harrow. Again, this is a picture where I have, I had these uh, rows that were right next to the fence and they were a little bit soddy. And so 
you know, sometimes your brome grass and your fence row extends out and then you have this, these pieces of sod and then you try and till and they roll around and then they wreck your first row. And so I just thought, well, I'll skip that first row because it didn't look like the harrow was doing a whole lot, but man, you can see it right to the line where the harrow drove and where it didn't. Um, and then I came back and this was right before I cultivated the first time. I mean, those beans have two trifoliates coming. So um, I cultivated them and cleaned it up pretty good and then harrowed it one more time. Another tool that I find very valuable is I mentioned that I have GPS on my tractor and there are there is implement drift and there is uh errors in the gps even though i have the one that's supposed to be like the most accurate rtx it's called um but i have this sliding hitch on my cultivator and that allows me to fine tune um the cultivator to make sure it's very precise um so that is um something i'd recommend the other thing I've done, and this is later in the season, but I learned this from the Amish people. And um, they were, th during organic inspection, they're showing me their cultivator and telling me how wonderful it is because they said, you know, you tractor farmers, um, you have to, you know, steer your tractor, but our horses, they, they know right where to go. We don't, you know, they just can follow the row and then we can focus on watching the cultivator and they have these little uh, levers on their feet and they can slide the cultivator from side to side. And so then I thought, well, I wonder if I could do that. So I put somebody in the tractor and I, I let them drive so I wouldn't have to steer it. And then I sat on the back of the cultivator and just watched the cultivator um, and had the, and, and there's actually whiskers that go with this navigator system, but there's a margin of error with that too. And so I could set my shovels in even tighter than I could with those whiskers and steer it and do a better job uh, getting up close to the row, which I think is really important. Oh yeah, and then you wanna have good support from your spouse. So um, this was when I first started organic farming and and look at all those buttonweeds that we had there, but yeah, you know, they make a nice little heart-shaped leaf. So uh, you wanna have somebody that loves you, can handle you being out there cultivating and rotary hoeing and harrowing when it's their birthday. Um, so anyway, that brings us to the conclusion of our, my um, explanation of my weed control system sharing of my slides. And so I assume, Olga, you have some time for some questions or maybe some questions have come up. Yes, there are some questions that have come up. Uh, you're welcome to stop sharing the screen if you'd like that way. We oh, good. Um, yep. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. That was extremely uh, helpful, I'm sure, to many. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with questions. Bruce Fields has a question. He said, do you have any experience with cutting weed seed heads off after they make it above the soybean canopy. I'm thinking of one made by Menguzo that's attached to the flea point behind the tractor and is essentially a long unfoldable sickle bar. Yeah, and I guess I've not used that type of equipment, but what I've done is, um, you know, there's some weeds out there that are sticking up above the soybeans. I've just gone out there what I do is with hand weeding is I try to pull the weeds out by the root because if I don't pull them out by the root, they send up a new stalk and they still get seeds on them. And so later in the season, if I see some weeds sticking up there, I'll just go out there with a cutter and cut the tops off of them. And I figure as long as the seed is still like in the milk stage, that it's probably not going to be very viable. And I just let them set there. If I have weeds that are, having hard seeds, like if it's ragweeds, I will carry those um, uh, weeds out of the field and burn them so that those weed seeds are not going to seed. So I don't have experience with that type of equipment, but I guess I use the concept, but I just do it manually. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question comes from Rodney. He said, is, is your corn in 30 inch rows? Yes. And I started, when I started, I had 36 inch rows. Uh, the advantage with 36 inch rows is that um, you have fewer rows and the, it, the weeds are always right in the row itself. In between the rows, that's easy to get clean with a cultivator, but it's dealing with the weeds that are growing right next to the crop. 
So you have fewer of those strips when you're on 36 inch rows versus 30s. Um, the positive thing about 30 inch rows is that everybody's system is set up for 30 inch rows and it's easy to find equipment. And hopefully you have, like your soybeans, you should have better yields in 30 inch rows than you do 36 inch rows. Okay, great. Thank you for extrapolating on that. Um, Fred has a question. He said, have you checked your soil organic matter over the years? Do you apply manure? Yes. So I always put manure on before my corn crop. I have, uh, like I said, hog manure that I can put on for corn after soybeans. I don't have enough hog manure for everything. My neighbor is a dairy farmer that has no land and he only has a dairy farm. And so I give him uh, forages and he gives me manure. And then I also will get some chicken manure and I usually put the dairy and the chicken manure on the oat field that's going to be corn. So my organic matter is, you know, around that four to five percent in most of my fields. But a lot of that, you know, it's hard to change organic matter. It's been good prairie soils for many years and um, hasn't had a lot of erosion to take away the topsoil. So I do have high organic matter and I don't know that it's changed a lot. But um, anyway, that's hopefully answers that question. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question has a, it's a question and then uh, Margaret responded to it and see if you um, uh, follow Margaret's uh, logic there. Wade said, so average row crop production year involves seven to nine tillage passes, question mark. And Margaret said, Wade, I don't really consider harrowing and rotary hoeing tillage passes. Field operations, yes that take time and money, but very little soil disturbance. How do you Right, know? right. And so, yeah, Margaret, she's a really smart person. And there's trips across the field. The thing about like that Harrow, my tractor tells me how much fuel I'm burning per hour and per acre. It's 0.1 gallons of diesel fuel per acre when you're going across there. My cultivator is 0.25 gallons of diesel fuel per acre. So it's mainly an investment of time um, that you're putting into it and your equipment, but it's burning little fuel and the tillage when you're going an inch and a half deep with a harrow, it's, it's not, uh, right. It's not like deep tillage, um, disking and chiseling and this sort of thing. So I know like there's always been this discussion about organic farmers and how much soil disturbance they're doing and, and wrecking the organic matter. And Cindy Cambridella, I guess, has done work on this and uh, uh, right of happy memory. And she uh, basically said that because organic farming encourages life in the soil, it's that life in the soil that's building up our organic matter and the tillage that we do, yes, it's not good for it, but it, 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 like, it works together. And so because we're better with life in the soil, it offsets any damage that the tillage will do. And plus I've got a year in there where I'm not cultivating when I have oats and clover. Yeah, and to actually extrapolate on that, there was a research done by United States Department of Agriculture where they looked uh, not just at the top five inches of the soil, but they actually went really deep, about 20 inches of the soil. And long story short, what they found is that on conventional no-till, the initial, the top inches of soil looked better than the organic. But when they looked overall, they mm -hmm. actually saw that the organic soils had a lot better organic matter, you know, in the depths of the soil, not just at the t at the top. So, um, but as far as t as operations, yeah, it, you're going across the field, and you know, for weed control, probably three times with either the tine harrow or the rotary hoe, and um, you know, two times, maybe three times with the uh, row crop cultivator, and yeah, so. I don't know, seven would kind of be the max for me. Okay. Uh, Sam has a question. He said, do you ever incorporate a full year of alpha alpha into your production, into your rotation? I, I have in my transition year. And the reason I don't put a full year of alpha alpha in is because that dairy farmer um, that I get manure from is, it's a little bit, the, the logistics is, he's not real close by, okay? And to my organic fields. And so kind of what I'm doing is I'm putting the dairy manure on conventional fields, sometimes the organic fields, but a lot of times the conventional fields. 
and then he gets my hay, but I got to get those nutrients back. And so alfalfa just takes a lot of potassium and, and uh, phosphorus. And so it's hard to get that dairy manure back to those actual organic fields. It's, it's a good idea. Um, Haymaking is a lot of work. The biggest problem I have is that the first cutting needs to be made about like May 17th, May 20th. And right then is when I'm planting my corn or harrowing my corn or uh, harrowing my soybeans. And then the second cutting has to be made a month later. So we're talking June 17th, June 20th. Well, that's when I'm cultivating my beans. I have too much work to do. I don't have time to make hay. And so that's the reason I don't have hay in there. Okay. Dennis asked, what soil type do you have? And then any soil health scores that you have gotten from the Haney test? Yeah, I haven't done the Haney test. I've considered it, but um, my soils are Floyd, it's the Floyd Kenyon Clyde uh, type of complex. I'm not in the Des Moines lobe, I'm east of the Des Moines lobe. And um, they're mainly a loam, um, uh, a clay loam is what it is. And they rank like 85 on the CSR scale, 80 to 85. So that's typically the soil types that I'm dealing with. Okay, Larry, um... Do you, Larry asked the question, he said, do you have any recommendations for a row cultivator for terraces and hills? Yes, I think the best kind of row cultivator in terraces and hills is, uh, and the simplest thing is if you can get a front mount cultivator because you can see where you're going when you have a rear mount cultivator. Um, as you steer the tractor, the rear of the tractor swings around and it's hard to keep the cultivator on the row. Now those guidance systems with the whiskers can't help with that. But if you wanna, there's 12 row front mount cultivators. Um, that seems to be the best when you have terraces and hills. You can have six row, 12 row, eight row, whatever you want. Okay, Sam uh, has another question. He says, do you, how do you manage N for second corn crop after soybeans? So, right, after your soybeans, the, the clover and alfalfa produce probably 100 pounds of nitrogen after the oat crop for the corn. So I have a good start on the nitrogen there. On the soybeans, you might get 50 units of nitrogen from that soybean, as that, that is a legume. And so then my hog manure, I'll put on about five or 6,000 gallons um, per acre of hog manure, and that gets me up to around 200 units of nitrogen, counting the credits that I have from the soybean crop. Okay. Um, somebody has a comment here, says, great work, Matt. Thank you for sharing. Do you also use any organic herbicides? Uh, no, no, I don't. No, I don't use any. I really, the only inputs I purchase are seeds and the chicken litter when I don't have enough hog manure and dairy manure. Okay. Otherwise, I don't buy anything other than seed. I don't buy any. I really don't. That's, that's awesome. Uh, Matt uh, has a question. What speed do you run uh, with your tine harrow? So there's people that will tell you all different speeds. When Before the crop comes up, you can go seven, eight mile an hour uh, because you're not hurting the crop. The way I like to run it when I am um, in the crop that is emerged is I go about three to three and a half miles per hour. And, and I'm taking 60 foot at a time, which I think turns out to be like 22 acres per hour. So I'm covering a good amount of ground, even though I'm only going three, three and a half miles per hour. Okay, great. Um, Raphael asked if the presentation will be available after the webinar. Yes, it will. It'll be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, definitely check that out. I'll also be sending a link to everybody that RSVP'd. So I'll stay on the lookout for that. Sam, has a question. He says, can you expand on your cultivator selection for each crop? Do you use the Case IH C shank for most operations in combination with your tine weeder? Yep. So Roger Lansing, he loves the Case IH 1820 cultivator. And so um, that's what I have. And I like it a lot too. I also like the John Deere 856 and I have that as well. They're both C shank cultivators. And those are the ones that I use in the soybean crop. In, and I and I use them. The thing about the what I like about the John Deere 856 is it comes with uh, uh, something called a Smith Fin uh, sweep, and so it's a real low-profile sweep. 
and it doesn't disturb a lot of soil and so I don't use uh, shields on it. And then um, in the corn crop, I use a Hineker 6000 um, cultivator and I have rotary hose shields on that and I also have the ridging wings. Um, it's not as luxurious, I guess, as a buffalo cultivator, but it's a good cultivator. And it's, so that's a single sweep one. And the reason I like that is that corn's a little bit taller and I push a little bit more soil into that corn row to cover up any small weeds that um, didn't get taken out. And that's worked really good for me. Awesome. Andrew has a question says, do you have any recommendations for book resource on what cover crops, et cetera, contribute different nutrient credits to future crops? Thanks for the presentation. I guess as far as cover crops, um, the resource I would uh, recommend on that is there is an organization called um, Midwest, it's like something like Midwest Cover or Michigan Cover Crop Alliance or Midwest Cover Crop Alliance, Margaret Smith would know. Um, and I think that Albert Lee Seedhouse, uh, you know, does that, but it has all these cover crops. They have a web page and it has all these cover crops and the advantages of every cover crop. If it's good at suppressing weeds, if it's good at building up soil, um, everything is listed. And so you can, and what seasons it grows, if you want to plant it in the fall or in the spring, um, and that will help you pick out what species are best for your goals for yeah. your cover crop. Arla actually commented in the chat and he said Midwest Cover Crop Council. There we go. Yep. Mm -hmm. All righty. Um, next question. What corn and soybean maturity range do you typically plan? Do you have on-farm drying capabilities? Yep. I have a dryer and... I like to plant the corn that's 104 to 108 day. And so again, I'm in Northern Iowa. I'm uh, basically 60 miles from the Minnesota border. That's how far North I am. And I go with 100 to 104 to 108 day corn varieties. My soybeans are um, food grade uh, 3054 from Iowa State. And they're like, 2.5s or 2.6s so they're pretty full season for my area i i do like i do have good success planting those soybeans around the first part of may but it seems like with corn i've given up uh trying to plant it early it should be planted about may 15th and that's when you really get the best results don't go before that date okay um, next question, how many acres of each crop do you uh, raise each year any livestock of your own um, I have, uh, of the organic crops, I have in this four-way rotation and basically 150 acres of oats, 150 acres of soybeans, and 300 acres of, of corn is uh, what I have for acres. And as far as the livestock, um, these hog barns that I'm talking about that I get the manure from, Lynch Livestock has a, a non-antibiotic pig and that's the program that we're doing. The Lynch Livestock owns the pigs. So I don't own any pigs. Um, we just take care of them and get the manure out of the barns. Okay, next question. And I know you guys, it's past one o'clock. So if you have to drop off, you can. You can view the recording later. Um, but we'll continue here for another couple of minutes. Um, Fred is asking, have you planted directly in growing cover crops then rolled down? Example, soybeans into rye. You know, and I haven't done that. And and I don't, I guess what I'll say with that is that I, I, I've seen it as an organic inspector when, and this was, I haven't done organic inspections here for a couple of years now, but um, I'm sure there's newer developments. But the problem that I saw with this rolling down system is that sometimes people would have great results and then sometimes it's a disaster. It wasn't consistent. And so the thing about the system that I use is I like that it's consistent. And, um, and so, you know, we shouldn't give up on that idea of rolling things down, but I just think we need to have um, better results consistently. Okay, and then we'll make this our final question. Um, do you participate in any government income equality programs for farmers? I, I don't know exactly 
what that would be. When I first started doing an organic, they had equip for transitioning to organic and they paid you like a subsidy to help you in those years when you have to follow organic practices and get lower yields from organic, but still get commodity prices, you know, so that's a tough, tough few years to, to deal with. And so the equip program paid us uh, for those transition years. And I did u- utilize that program, but um, mm. I, I haven't really used any other government programs rather than the regular, uh, they call it whatever money they pay to every other orga- every other farmer out there. I can't even remember what it's called. It's like ARC and, and, and something, s- something like that. It has initials that you sign up at the FS. That, yeah. Yeah, ARC, CO, and TLC. So I get money from that, but other than that, I don't get any money from the government. Yeah, and and as far as like a different different programming uh, for organic farmers, I'd recommend checking out Farm Service Agency, your local Farm Service Agency um, people there, and, and they'll be able to provide you with more information on on programs that are available. All right, yeah. you guys, we, we went over. Matt, thank you from the bottom of my heart. You, uh, an amazing presentation, very, very um, helpful to many uh, folks. What, what I'll do is I'll upload this to our YouTube channel as well as send you a link to uh, this presentation um, as well as a short survey. It will uh, take you about five minutes to complete. We use this information to uh, report to our, our grantors. So please uh, complete the survey if you can. Um, and thank you again for being part of the webinar this week. We actually have another webinar coming up next week. So so check out our calendar and please uh, join that one as well. Matt, thank you again for uh, being part of our winter webinar series here in 2022 and for this uh, uh, amazing presentation. Well, thanks, Olga. It was a pleasure. And I guess the last thing I would say is, you know, if anybody wants to call or ask me questions, I'm open to that. I know other people have called and I enjoy, like I said, I'm not perfect at we control every year but i enjoy it and um if that can help people get some good ideas i'm excited to do that and that's what's amazing about organic farmers organic farmers are gonna support you and help you and matt is a prime example of that matt thank you thank you so much and thanks everyone for joining and hope you guys have a great rest of your day bye